All right, good evening. Turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. Ecclesiastes chapter number 9. Title of my sermon tonight is The Words of, a wise, of wise Men Are Heard in Quiet. The Words of Wise Men Are Heard in Quiet. I've retrieved that out of one of the verses I'm going to read before I begin my sermon tonight. I want to talk a little bit about wisdom. Seems like there's a lot of it lacking today. Um, you go into a restaurant, my wife and I, Last night, decided to go out on a date, and we went into a restaurant, and all the servers have masks and gloves and everything on, and, you know, I just, I just think to myself, you know, is all that really that necessary, honestly? I mean, wisdom is, and you'll find tonight, something that's attained by experience, and experience tells me if I cover my mouth and breathe in my own exhaled air, I'm sucking in carbon dioxide, which lowers my immune system, weakens my health, and causes a whole other group of issues. But I guess that's what you get when you listen to the media, and next thing you know, you'll be holding, hoarding toilet paper. So anyway, let's try to get our heads out of the sand tonight and go over a little bit of wisdom. King Solomon is known for his wisdom. So in Ecclesiastes chapter number 9, verse number 13, he's going to expound a little bit on this. Starting in verse number 13, this wisdom have I, have I seen also under the sun. And it seemed great unto me. There was a little city and a few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and, grew, and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city. Amen. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Yes. The words of, a, of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. Amen. Now I want to uh, skip on down into chapter 10, verse number 6. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. I have seen servants upon horses and prince walking as servants upon the earth. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh a hedge, a, ser a serpent shall bite him. Whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. Verse number 10, if the iron be blunt and he do not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength, but wisdom is profitable to direct. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask that it would be your words tonight, not mine that it would be your Holy Spirit that we would be able to learn out of your word and maybe attain some wisdom tonight. Lord, I ask that you put me aside and let it be your words and not mine or my opinions tonight, Lord. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Do you, do you realize tonight, as I talk about wisdom, that wisdom in your King James Bible is mentioned 222 times? So it must be important if God mentioned it 222 times. First time it's mentioned is in the book of Exodus in regards to Aaron as he is getting ready to take over the administration of the office of priest, him and his sons. So wisdom is a really important thing. So I thought it'd be appropriate that we get the definition of wisdom since it is mentioned 222 times in your Bible. Wisdom is the quality of having experience, yeah. knowledge, and good judgment. And if we were all true tonight with ourselves, we have still a lot more to learn, do we not? <laughs> At least I know I do. And that's the thing tonight. We're going to go over a few separate cases of where one needs to learn from experience or wisdom. 
So in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, two, the two verses 17 and 18, I just want us to keep these on our mind as we go through the word of God. The words of wise men are heard and quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. And you know what? We remember usually the greatest sayings of our time or things that we remember that we've heard. Uh, we have nothing to fear but fear, our, fear itself. And all the great battle cries throughout time, we tend to remember those words of wisdom more than we remember many of the foolish sayings like, where's the beef? Right? I mean, at least we should remember the more wise things, right? Some of us, that's about as far as we go in wisdom. But I also want to keep in mind verse number 10 of chapter 10. If the iron be blunt and he does not wet the edge, then must he put to more strength. And you know what that means? It's better to work smarter than harder, right? I mean, it's better that we use the right equipment when we're doing any kind of work that requires equipment, something that's sharp. If you're cutting down a tree, you want to make sure your ax is sharp and not dull, right? Because it makes the job that much easier. And here's what we got to remember. If we use our wisdom and we use what we've learned, and it says wisdom is experience. We get our wisdom from experience and things that have happened in our life. Don't let things that have happened in your life go for naught. Make sure you turn that around and make it something that you can get wiser from. You know, and unfortunately, many of our kids today, they watch us and they see the mistakes we've made and they follow right in the same footsteps, right? Yeah, they do. So I want to keep those things in our mind tonight as we go through, starting with our, our first point. Our first point is be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you ask for. As someone, it's right, Pastor, you may get what you ask for. You may get it. Turn, we won't be going back to these passages. I just wanted to start out with something that allowed us to set our minds towards wisdom tonight. So in Ecclesiastes chapter number 1, Ecclesiastes chapter number 1, I believe this sets the stage for going into being careful what you ask for, because God just might give it to you. Verse number 16, this is King Solomon. I communed with my own heart saying, Lo, I am come to great estate and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. There's a lot of truth to that, is there not? It's like the more of the Bible I read and the more that I study, the sometimes sadder I can get. Sometimes it can get really heavy on me because I see so many people out there that are not obeying God's word. And I know if they just follow the word of God, it'll help their life. And the wisdom that I've learned from the mistakes that I've made, I look at others and I say, if you just get in this book and you just put the other things aside in your life and you just dig deep and study and pray, it's going to help you. But see, I have a lot of grief and a lot of sorrow when I read God's word because I start thinking of of all the people that could benefit that I know from, from the teaching and yet they just won't listen. Or they'll say, you know, that's good for you, but it's not good for me. That goes for the saved and the unsaved. Obviously, those who aren't saved need it so they can have a home in heaven. But you know what? Having wisdom about God and his word is a heavy burden and is a heavy load to carry, is it not? And as parents, and many of you as grandparents, you have to admit what you know now in the Bible should be a lot more than what you knew yesterday, and that should be a heavy load for you to carry. Especially when we see the way the world is going. And we see all the deception, all the lies, everything that's coming into play now more than ever before. Would you not agree? that we need to be wise. The Bible says we need to be wise as serpents and yet harmless as doves. What does that mean to be wise as a serpent? A serpent doesn't go out looking for a fight. Usually a serpent only strikes when he's cornered. But yet we need to be wise 
and harmless like a dove as well. We need to try to do what's right. That being said, I'd like to turn to James chapter number one. James chapter number one. Because see, there's a guy in the Bible who penned Ecclesiastes. And you're going to see what he asked for. And why maybe King Solomon should have been a little more careful in what he asked for. Because I believe he got what he was looking for. James chapter number 1, verse number 2. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That's an easier one to say than to do, is it not? But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Listen, if you're asking God for more knowledge in his word, God's going to give you more knowledge in his word. If God's asking you for wisdom so that you do the right thing, he'll give you the wisdom. Now, if you're asking for wisdom on what stocks to buy, I don't really think God's going to tell you which one to buy. He's not going to give you the winning lottery numbers. Because that's not what's best for you tonight, is a bunch of money. Because if God wanted you to have money, you'd have it already. You're going to see that here in a minute. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Look, when you ask God for wisdom and you ask him in faith nothing wavering, you need to realize that he's going to give you that wisdom. And don't be afraid of it. But do know this, with much wisdom comes much grief. There really does come grief with knowing. For let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. What man? The one who doesn't have faith. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. That being said, let's turn in our Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter number one. Second Chronicles chapter number one. <clears throat> Some of my pages are starting to stick together, but I'm afraid to get a new Bible. It's like getting a new bike, I'll fall off it, right? <laughs> I won't know where I'm at. Some verses I know just because I've marked them and gone to them multiple times. Now, I want you to notice something. This is King Solomon getting ready to take over the reign from his father, King David. And this is really important because King Solomon may have realized in Ecclesiastes that he may have needed to be careful what he asked for. Because guess what? He got it. Right? So in Second Chronicles chapter number 1, verse number 6, the Bible reads, And Solomon went up hither to the brazen altar before the Lord, which was at the tabernacle of the congregation, and offered a thousand burnt offerings upon it. In that night did God appear unto Solomon and said unto him, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said unto God, Thou hast shown great mercy unto David my father, and hast made me to reign in his stead. Hey, he already knew that God walked with his father, but he needs to realize he needs to pay attention to what his father did wrong also. Now, O Lord God, let thy promise unto David my father be established, for thou hast made me king over a people like the dust of the earth in, the, in multitude. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can judge this thy people? That is so great. And God said to Solomon, because this was in your heart. God knows your heart. This was in his heart. King Solomon was not a double-minded man in all his ways. He wasn't saying this to God so he could get wealth. God gave him the wealth, and you're going to see in a minute, because this is what was in his heart, the faith, the faith to lead. He asked God for the wisdom and the knowledge to judge and look after his people. And every pastor in America, instead of worrying about numbers, instead of worrying about what we're not doing, instead of worrying about the things that don't matter, need to worry about taking care of the people we do have and loving those people and having wisdom and being in God's word so that we can do right by them and take care of them. Amen? 
But too many preachers out there are so worried about whether or not they're going to make their car payment that they're lacking the faith that it takes for God to meet that need for them in their church. They're just scared. I've never seen so much fear in all my days. The only time I saw fear like this was when that great president, Jimmy Carter, ran interest rates up to 17.5%. Obviously, I'm kidding. He's horrible. He was horrible. And if you like Jimmy Carter, you probably like peanuts as well. Good night. And to say he was a Baptist scares me. And thou hast not asked riches, wealth, or honor, nor the life of thine enemies, neither yet hast thou asked long life, but hast asked wisdom and knowledge for thyself, that thou mayest judge my people over whom I have made thee king. That being said, we don't have a king over our churches, but King Solomon also was a preacher as well. He preached. So if we take this as an example we should say, you know what, we have flocks to look after. We have people to care for and look after. We have people that we need to protect spiritually as well as physically, if at all possible. A shepherd should be capable of all those things. But you know what? Because he asked for the right thing, I truly believe God gave him the other things so that King Solomon eventually would become humble. Because that much wisdom and that much knowledge would be hard for any one person to go through life and not get puffed up or think too high of themselves. Would you agree? So God gives him a double whammy, I believe, in verse number 12. Wisdom and knowledge is granted unto thee, and I will give thee riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had that have been before thee, neither shall there be any after thee, have the like. You know what? God said, because you wanted to do the right thing, I'm going to give you all these other things as well. But you know what? In all honesty, we need to be careful what we ask for. Because as I'm going to show you here in a minute, I believe that comes back to haunt King Solomon. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 18, when he says, in much wisdom is much grief, and in much knowledge is much sorrow. Because he was given wealth beyond all the kings of Israel. King Solomon was probably the wealthiest man to ever live. He probably, in his day, the equivalent of wealth that he had probably went way past Jeff Bizios, probably went way past Bill Gates and the likes of those guys. But I believe it eventually got to him, and it brings anybody down if that's what you start to go after. I believe... If King Solomon would have said, God, you know what? I thank you for giving me the wisdom and knowledge, but for me, it would be better for me to struggle a little bit to make ends meet so I wouldn't forget about you. I think that would have been true wisdom, and I believe that's what the sum of Ecclesiastes is about. In verse 12, or chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, he said, Remember the Creator in the days of thy youth before the evil days come. And while he was young, before the evil really came upon him, he probably could have said to God, you know what, thank you for the offer of the wealth and the riches and the honor, but I just want to serve your people, and I just want to be like that. But God knew, because God always knows best. And I'll tell you this, if King Solomon would have done what he was supposed to with what he was given, his, a lot of the things that, that he did wouldn't have turned out the way they did. See, one of, the, one of the things that gets brought off, and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy 17. See, <clears throat> it's better that we get in the Bible ourselves than for King Solomon to just have heard it from his parent or parents. But in Deuteronomy 17, if King Solomon would have studied the scriptures the way he should have, he maybe would have come across this verse instead of following the example and the mistakes his dad made. Because what us parents do in moderation, our children and grandchildren will do in excess. 
Why? Because nothing bad usually sometimes will happen to you. Oh, wait, King David, except for a lot of bad things happen to you. You didn't get to build the temple because blood was on your hands. Hey, guess what? Your oldest son gets killed by Joab. Hey, King David, 70,000 men in Israel get killed because you decide to number the people. Hey, King David, you made a mess of a lot of things, didn't you? But the difference was King David knew how to get his heart right. And I believe King Solomon allowed things to go just a little bit too long and just a little bit too far. And that's why Israel ends up divided as a nation in 2 Kings chapter 16 and 17 is because King, King Solomon decides to just do it his way all the time. And as he looks back and he pens the words in your Bible, he realizes with much wisdom comes much sorrow. Many mistakes. Many mistakes. What made King David a man after God's own heart was the fact that King David knew how to get right with God. He didn't let that thing just go on and on forever. He got it right. And that's a lot of wisdom. But he didn't pick that up from his dad. And he definitely didn't pick up one of the, one of the big mistakes he did from the Bible. Verse number 14. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee and shall possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. You know, after Deuteronomy comes Joshua, and then Judges. See, God already knew eventually they'd set up a king. But it wasn't God's will for him to have a king. See, when they went to Samuel, and Samuel went to the Lord, the Lord had to tell Samuel, hey, Samuel, they're not denying you. They're denying me. They're rejecting me. 15. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. Hey, guess what? That's one of the reasons why a president of the United States, including Barack Obama, needs to be a natural born citizen. Did you know that? That that's where that comes from? Oh, but you'd never hear that today from the liberal crowd, would you? No. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses for as much as the Lord has said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more to that way. Hey, you're not to rule over the people in such a rigorous way that they want to go back to the world. But get this, verse number 17. King Solomon, were you listening? Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply himself to himself silver and gold. Hmm. That's really interesting, isn't it? Maybe King Solomon, if you would have read Deuteronomy 17, 17, you wouldn't have married 700 women. See, here's the thing. So many people like the Mormons say, see, you can marry all these people. You can do all these things. Yeah, but you sacrifice the sweet fellowship and the one-on-one -on -one relationship with one person, which far outweighs 10,000 others because you have no intimacy. You have no fellowship. You have no communion together like a husband and wife see he created them male and female created he them he created them male and female so that a father and mother as a son you should leave them and cling unto your wife and the two become one flesh not two thousand fleshes see if king solomon would have heeded the word of god and not just taken the example from his father and he would have had the wisdom to discern that his father made great mistakes and it cost him his oldest son's life and it cost him seventy thousand men of the choice men of israel if he had just paid attention to god's word maybe maybe looking back through the hourglass of time king solomon would have said in ecclesiastes chapter one with much wisdom comes great happiness because I decided to do what you wanted me to do and that was the greatest wisdom I could have ever attained was your word Deuteronomy 17 17 why and it in verse 18 and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests the Levites hmm that means you should probably talk to your pastor if you're having trouble. Right, King Solomon? But you weren't doing that. You decided to do it your own way because you got a little puffed up. 
And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes, to do them. Why? Because guess what? You'll have long life and prosperity if you just obey this book. You're not going to die of cirrhosis of the liver if you're obeying God's law and you're not drinking. You're not going to die of lung cancer from smoking cigarettes if you're not smoking them. You're not going to die in a drunk driving accident at your hand if you're not drunk and driving. Unfortunately, there are other people that are not doing that. And they should not be driving a vehicle. That is heart in verse 20. That is heart be not lifted up above his brethren. And that he should turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom. But get this. He and his children in the midst of Israel. And if you've ever read First and Second Kings, and you start to get into the point where you get to King Solomon, then you get to Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and all these different kings of Israel and Judah, and you see these guys, and you see all the turmoil. You see the ups and downs of each one of the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, the Hezekiahs. You see all these faults. Why? Because they were never looking back at the mistakes their father made, or grandfather, or great-grandfather. See, one of the greatest things about getting older is realizing, hey, I don't want to make the same mistake twice. Right? You should be wise enough to realize if it isn't working, stop doing it. It's done. Just be done with it. But yet we still continue to do the same thing over and over again. And therefore King Solomon needed to be careful what he asked for because guess what? He got it. And at the end of his days... As he's penning Ecclesiastes and he's writing the book of Proverbs and he's talking about wisdom and he's talking about how important it is to have wisdom and understanding and knowledge. What he's saying is, is please don't do what I did. It's not worth it. It's better to have a good name than choice silver or any riches. That's what he penned in Proverbs. What's he also say? Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. What's he say? Pride cometh before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. What's he say? Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. What's he say? These are five things that I hate, yea, seven, a proud look. What's he saying? He's saying, listen to me, please, before it's too late. Before it's too late. Wisdom is learning from experience, sometimes the experience of others, and saying, I need to stay away from that. But yet there are religions today like Islam and the Mormons that say, oh, King, King Solomon made a mistake. Well, maybe, but in the Bible he had a lot of wives. So what? You don't have a relationship with anyone then. You're totally alone. You have no one you can count on. I count on my wife. I lean on my wife. She encourages me. Keep going. You can do it. You can do it. See, that's what intimacy and a relationship's about. But King Solomon, I don't believe, really had that. And he should have learned it from his father, who had enough trouble with it as well. With Saul's daughter. I mean, it just goes on and on. But yet many religions, because of the lust of their flesh and the deceived, deceived heart that they have, they choose to think and glorify that that's some kind of bonus. You're actually cursing yourself by doing that. King Solomon was pretty much cursed by doing that. He really was. Why? Because at the end he knew it was wrong. And these words are settled forever in heaven and we know it was wrong. <clears throat> Second point, when wisdom shows you a warning, when wisdom shows you a warning, turn to Ezekiel chapter number 7. Ezekiel chapter number 7. Be careful when you ask for wisdom, but you need to be really careful when what you've seen that doesn't work, society and humanity is doing it all over again. When you read things in the Bible and you see the direction of the world we have today, wisdom should tell you, wait a minute, stop. This place is on fire. 
That's what's coming. <clears throat> Verse number 25. And this is when God's getting ready to judge Israel. Way after King Solomon. King David, King Solomon, King Hezekiah, they're gone. Now it's handed off to lesser men. Lesser sons. Verse 25. Destruction cometh, and they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. You ever feel like sometimes when things are getting really bad, you just want it to stop? You know, things are falling apart. I mean, maybe when you were younger, I can remember the days when a bill collector would call, you were out of work, and, and, and maybe your kid got hurt and had to have something done at the hospital, and it was going to cost you a lot of money, and, and then you didn't have the money to put gas in your car, but yet you needed groceries, and at some time when destruction is coming, you're saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, please stop. Give me a break. I need to breathe. Right? You ever felt like that? Anybody in here ever feel like that in your life? Oh, yeah, it happens. And when destruction cometh, they shall seek peace, and there shall be none. And unfortunately, that is a cruel lesson to learn, that sometimes when you want peace, it isn't going to be there, and you have no peace. That's why it's so important for you to get the wisdom of God, so that you can search him out for the peace, because he has the peace that passes all understanding. Look, you can be as poor as a church mouse. You can be starving to death in a third world country today. You can be running for your life against some extremists from some other religion and have more peace than half the Americans today as they're wearing a stupid mask across their face while their eyeballs are all exposed. The biggest mucous membrane in your face, your eyeballs. And then the other ones, you know who I really like? These are my favorite. The ones you go into the store and you see them, and you're like, well, everybody's got a mask. Then you got that guy who's got the mask on like this. You're like, how you doing? He's like, oh, pretty good. I said, yeah, I have trouble breathing. (laughs) You think? Because you're breathing in your own carbon dioxide again. Anyway, I could go on for days. Verse 26, mischief shall come upon mischief, and rumor shall be upon rumor. Then shall they seek a vision of the prophet, but the law shall perish from the priest. And the counsel from the ancients, the king shall mourn, and the prince shall be clothed with desolation, and the hands of the people of the land shall be troubled. I will do unto them after their way, and according to their deserts will I judge them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. You wonder where the verse or the saying comes? You'll get your just desserts right there, right there. You know how many things actually come from the Bible that people have quoted for years, but yet they want to deny America was ever founded on Christianity? Fools. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Yet almost everything we do is in this book, including the mistakes like these guys. And wisdom shows you a warning. But you know what? Here's the problem. Many of the pastors and preachers and priests of today, I wonder how much they actually do know. I really do question it. Because a lot of them are not preaching what they should be still. They're not talking about America getting back to God, getting right with God. They're talking about, oh, you can have your best life now, and it's okay, and, and just socialize with social distancing, and it'll be all right, and we'll work it out all in the end, and everything's going to be good. Just send me your check, because the church needs to go on. I need to make my $25 million uh, house payment, like Joel Osteen and Joyce Meyer, and, and all these people have, and just please, please, if you, if you send me some money, I'll send you an autographed napkin with my name on it. I question a lot of their salvation. Because I'll tell you right now, in chapter number 8, verse number 1, And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me, there fell there upon me. Let me tell you something. A lot of preachers don't have the hand of God falling on them. And I'll tell you what, many of them don't like it because sometimes when God gets your attention, guess what happens next? Verse number two, Then I beheld, and lo, the likeness as the appearance of fire. 
From the appearance of his loins even downward fire, and from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my head. What's he saying? God grabbed me by my hair. And God needs to grab a lot of these preachers by their hair tonight and pick them up and hold them up so they can see what's really going on in America. But they're not. And God's not picking them up because he's letting them fall into their own mischief because they're not wise. They're not following the counsel of this book. They're not even reading it for crying out loud. And many of them are reading it or reading the wrong one. Amen. Wrong one. Amen. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter number 4. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number 4. See, it's not a light thing. Many should be wise if they want to see. You know, the Bible says if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desire a good work. A good work. You need to be real careful if you desire something. You need to be real careful not to desire, desire something you can't attain. Or you can't keep. And you're going to compromise? Don't do it. If you're going to backpedal and back down, don't do it. You're better off not doing it. Verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. But you know what? They're so scared. So many of them today are so backed in a corner. If they're even saved, many of them, many of, many of these teachers, I hear them on the radio, and I don't really like what I hear. I really don't. It scares me. More now than ever before in human history does it scare me what's coming out of the mouths of some of the so-called men of God. They've strayed so far from this book. Very far. Verse 13, Till we all come in the unity of, of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? Verse 14, That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are people, there are preachers that are lying in wait to deceive you. Why? Because they get some money out of the deal. They've already sold their soul to the devil, so-called. They have. And I'm going to tell you something right now as we lead into the second point. Let's read verse number 17. Yeah. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind or emptiness. You ever heard the term empty-headed? Having the understanding darkened. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their heart. And get this. Who being past feeling have given, them, given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness. What's the Bible saying in 2 Peter chapter 2? Having eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin. They themselves are the servants of sin. That's why they can talk so plainly about it and openly and so flippantly about it. Oh, we all do it. We don't ever need to glorify sin or our past. We need to say God saved us. He cleaned us up. Let's just move on. Yeah, I'm a sinner still. I was, I was rotten then, but I'm getting cleaned up and I'm going the right way. I'm not veering to the right. I'm not veering to the left. I'm going straight because straight is the way. And that's the way I want to go. We don't need to sit here and talk about everybody's skeletons in their closet. But they'll just go along with you. Try to make you feel more normal. It's not normal. And King Solomon, he needed to hear that, he needed to hear that from his dad as well. Hey son, it's, what I did was wrong. I need to forsake it. I'm sorry. I messed up. Don't do what I did. Not only when you get wisdom and knowledge, get the wisdom from me, the life experience where I made the mistakes. And you don't make those mistakes. Please. It'll ruin your life. Your older brother, Absalom, dead. Killed as he tried to rebel and go against me and take the kingdom from me. And that wasn't God's will. And he's in hell right now burning forever and how do you know Absalom wasn't saved read the book you'll come to the same conclusion he was not saved 
Turn to Daniel chapter 5. There's always a warning. We can go back into the Old Testament. I can't tell you how many commentaries I've read. I can't tell you how many times I've read somebody's study notes at the end of a Bible. I don't care who the Bible teacher is, many of them. You need to stay clear from those notes. You really do. I'm going to throw this heat out, heat of warning and caution to you. Look, if you want to know what the Bible says, you ask God. Now, there are some things you may and I may not understand this side of glory. But you need to be really careful. Really careful. And I mean that. Because there are some writings in some of these Bibles that will take you down a fairy tale road. And the next thing you know, you're going to be believing in the Easter Bunny. I'm telling you right now, you need to be careful. See, this is another story of a father who passed something down to his son. And this is where King Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, is handed over the Babylonian kingdom. And he decides to take all the vessels that they took out of Jerusalem and he decides to give it to his wives and his concubines and his servants and they start praising the gods of gold, silver, and getting drunk. And then all of a sudden, guess what happens? And many of us have heard the story. There's a hand, then there's writing, there's a wall, and then he doesn't know what to do, right? We remember, right? So what does he do? What's the king do? So in verse number 6, Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. Hey, guess what, king? It's a little too little too late at this point. You've already crossed the line, my friend. You've already darkened your heart. You're already blind. Reprobate silver shall men be called because the Lord has rejected him. Why? Because he's got no place to realize repentance. He has no place to turn to the Lord now. He's already made his bed. Now he's going to sleep in it. Verse number seven, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said unto the wise men of Babylon, whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom, right? And all these guys are probably jumping on it because a false prophet, a false teacher, Somebody wicked, all they do is love money, they're going to jump on the opportunity of a little bit of power and a whole lot of cash, right? But verse number 8 is great. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing, nor make known known to the king the interpretation thereof. Huh. Because, you know, it was probably written in something that nobody knew, right? Nobody had ever heard that. What was written, right? Maybe? Let's find out. For the sake of time, we're going to skip to verse number 20. Verse number 20. And this is after Daniel's brought in. A same chapter, I'm sorry. Chapter 5, verse 20. Um, This is after Daniel's then brought in. And Daniel then reminds him who his father was. And what his father did. So starting in verse number 20, Daniel's going to explain to this guy the same condition. See, Belshazzar should have had a little bit of wisdom. And he should have learned that, hey, when I rejected God and thought I was in charge and I was the greatest, that God took my father's mind and gave him the heart of a beast. And he sat out in the field for seven years. Remember that story? Oh, yeah. Well, he didn't. So he didn't learn nothing from his dad. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed of, disposed from the kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. And this is the worst part. And I guarantee you throughout all eternity, these words are ringing in the ears of Belshazzar's as he's screaming in hell. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest this. You knew, and you did nothing about it. You knew. And you mocked God, 
and you mock them for the last time. You mock God, and now there's no remedy. None. So let's get down to verse 25. <clears throat> and this is the writing that was written. Mean, mean, tekel of Harzan. Yeah. Now I don't need to go into all this, but I'm going to tell you this right now. Do you know that those words were written in Aramaic? How many knew that? Aramaic, which was the common language of the Babylonians. What happened? What happened? God hid the meaning from all the wise men, all the astrologers, and their hearts were darkened, their understanding was darkened, just like Ephesians chapter number 4. Because if they were given the opportunity to deceive, they would have. They would have, because they would have wanted to have the gold. They would have wanted to have the scarlet robe. They wanted to have been the third ruler in the kingdom, but they couldn't. Because in verse number 8 it says, they could not read the writing or make known the interpretation thereof. You can go home tonight and check it out. Aramaic. That was the language of the Babylonians. And that's the language in which this was written. So God gave Daniel the knowledge because Daniel had the wisdom. He was the man for the job. He was the one. He had the experience. He had already helped his father. But there was no help for him. That being said... Wisdom can also show you salvation. I've showed you what we should learn from it, and we need to be careful what we ask for. I've showed you tonight that there are people that think they're wise in their own eyes and they're leading people astray. But I want you to know that through this Bible and through the Word of God, wisdom shows you salvation. Wisdom shows you salvation. What do you mean by that? How can wisdom show you salvation? Well, the Bible is written by men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. But I believe some of their experiences were in here as well. So turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Paul had a very good and a very bad and a very difficult experience throughout his ministry. Even the start of his ministry was a struggle for him. He thought he was doing the work of God as he was torturing Christians. He thought he was doing the right thing. And then God had to get a hold of him, didn't he? And after that, God said, you know what, Paul? You're going to suffer many things. Because with much wisdom comes much sorrow. And with much knowledge, heaviness of heart. Paul, you're going to have a burden for your people, but many of them aren't going to listen. Many of them aren't going to listen. Hey, hey, Paul, your heart's desire is that all Israel will be saved. You'd even call yourself accursed if you could. But guess what? They won't. And your heart will be torn. And God will let you give the gospel out still. But he'll let you give it to someone else to provoke them to jealousy. Paul, I know you want to be the great preacher because you're a Pharisee of Pharisees. But because you didn't understand my words, because you spent time in the synagogue, you were a Pharisee of Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin. You thought you had all the answers all the time, but you overlooked the most important things, Paul. The whole, te the whole scripture testifies of me, and you missed it. And you missed it. Because you know what? You had your eyes open. You had your ears open to the preachers, but you didn't open your heart. Right? See, King Solomon asked, and God said, it's because it's in your heart that I'm going to give you this. But because of that, Paul had a very trying ministry. And in 1 Corinthians, verse number 17, he goes to plead with the Corinthians for the first time. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words. Look, I can tell you I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees. I know the Old Testament. But it isn't going to do you any good. Lest the cross of Christ should be none effect. I need to preach the cross. I need to preach the cross. 
See, I could tell you about my credentials all day long. I have a PhD in philosophy and theology and numerology or whatever. But what I need to tell you is, is the preaching of the cross. That's what I got to tell you. I could tell you all about the Levitical law. I could tell you all about every king. I could tell you that no prophet is to come out of Nazareth. I could tell you all these things. But now I just need to keep it simple. Because wisdom tells me I need to preach the cross. Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I have to preach the gospel. I can't be a legalist anymore. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. This book is wiser than any book you'll find in your local library. This book is wiser than all the encyclopedias, Britannica, that they keep updating and updating and updating and going back and changing. The wisdom of God. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty. Look, it's not by the strength, but by wisdom. Amen. Remember that in Ecclesiastes 9? Not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base the things of the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, the things which are not to bring not things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. Chapter 2 verse 4. And my speech and preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Your salvation should not be based on how you felt. Your salvation should be based on the facts in this book. Your salvation doesn't need to be in shaking a preacher's hand, kissing a baby, whatever it is. Your salvation is based upon the time that you got with God and you gave your heart to him. Because I'm sure you can bring nothing into this world and I guarantee you ain't taking nothing out. The only thing you can give God, the only thing is your heart. It's the only thing. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It says right here that no flesh should glory in his presence. And right there, if you're doing it, you can glory in the presence of the Lord because you saved yourself. Or you had some part in it. That's why Paul says, hey, Christ sent me not to baptize. Oh, you should get baptized. It's your first step in obedience to following Jesus Christ. So you can symbolize with them. But he didn't send Paul to baptize. He sent him to preach the cross. He sent him to preach the gospel. What's the good news? That Jesus did it all. And all to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. The baptistry didn't wash nothing. I, I can dunk myself until my skin falls off. And I won't have one of my sins taken away in that water. And if I left that water sit and I've cleaned that baptistry, you're going to find mold in it. How does that take anything away? How does a sacrament at, a, at the hand of some pedophile priest who's drinking wine and slapping you upside the head and telling you you're wrong and you need to give him money so you can do indulgences, which are sins that they allow you to commit. How does that save you? Amen. Religion will never save you. Faith saves you. Faith. Turn to Acts chapter 20. I got a few minutes. Acts chapter 20. 
Poor Paul. His wisdom showed many how to be saved. Oh, but there was a price he had to pay. <clears throat> Verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Hey, Paul, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer for Jesus. But he still went. Verse 23, Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations, right? We read that in James. Count it all joy, Paul. You're going to be with Jesus soon. I have received the Lord, which I have received of the Lord, Jesus, to testify the gospel of gr the grace of God. Grace. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. How sad would it be if your preacher was here and he said, you know what, I have to go off. There's a, a religious uh, uh, persecution going on and I got to go. The Holy Spirit's calling me there. I may lose my life. You'll see my face no more. That'd be terrible for us. But it would be great for those who get saved. Verse 26, wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Showing you the whole Bible. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God. Hey, Jehovah's Witness, to feed the church of God. God, which he purchased with his own blood. Oh, oh, God, God purchased it with his own blood? Yeah, his name is Jesus. 1 John 5, and Jesus Christ, this is the true God. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Not sparing the flock. There are certain men crept in unawares before of old, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. They'll creep in and they'll corrupt Jesus on you. Be careful. They're lying in wait, cunning, crafty people. And Paul knew it. Also, of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. You know, Paul loved his churches that he started. This was the church at Ephesians or Ephesus. Do you realize at another place in the book of Exodus, Paul went to battle with many of the people in the city of Ephesus? Did I say he Ephesus? The Bible accounts that, the, that he says, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. Beasts! He wasn't talking about lions and tigers and bears, oh my. He was talking about people. He was talking about people. He fought with them. And he tried to persuade them. Why? So that he could save some. You know, salvation isn't meant to be tricky. God didn't send salvation through his son for his son to pay it all so that he could confuse you. He wants it to be simple. Salvation is simple. Paul says, I can explain the simplicity that's in Christ. What is it? For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Hey, but you know what? That's not really easy to believe in your heart. And there are many people in the world today that can't. They can't. Because they'd rather believe a science book. They'd rather believe Bill Nye, the dumb science guy, instead of the Bible. They'd rather believe some wisdom of men. They'd rather follow their church to the grave than believe in their heart. To truly put all your faith 
from start to finish in Jesus Christ is hard for some people. And I believe tonight that many in our church here, if not all, are saved. And I hope you are. But we need to always examine ourselves. Why? Because Paul said, examine yourself to, be, to see if you are found in the faith. Sometimes you need to double check these things. It's not uncommon. But you know what? If you can remember a time when you called on Jesus and you said, Lord, save me, he'll save you. And you're saved. Why? For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall occasionally get saved. Shall, well, maybe it depends on if they cried. No, shall be saved. And we need to remember that because there's a lot of deception out here. Next month, they'll tell us it's bad for us to wear sunscreen and put masks on our face. But let's not be deceived when it comes to God's word. Amen. Right? Let's be not deceived when it comes to this book. Right. Let's make sure we know and we have the wisdom. And it's not supposed to be hard. We're not supposed to be cutting down a tree with a dull axe. It's supposed to come easy. Let's remember, and, and this is a good rule of thumb too, when you're reading through the Bible, just start with the clear passages. And know that those are true. The whole book's true, but start with the easy, clear passages. And things you may not understand, just pray and ask God and he'll show you. He may has another angle on which he wants to show you. So be patient. Let patient work, patience work her perfect way. In faith, ask, and he will. He's not going to keep wisdom from you. He's not going to keep the knowledge of this book hidden. He wants you to know what this book has to say. He didn't write this book so that only a select group of guys can read it to you. He didn't write it, you know, Ezekiel. When Ezekiel gets commissioned, he, God tells Ezekiel after pulling his hair up, he says, you know what, I didn't send you to a people of a different language, of a hard speech. I just sent you to the people you knew. God's not expecting you to do some to miracle he just says, hey, look, you see the problem? Take this book and fix it the best way you know how for people. Lead them to Jesus if you can. Lead them to Jesus. Let's make it our goal as a church. Now that we're coming out of the pandemic, I mean, uh, yeah. Well, now that we're coming out of that thing, now maybe we can start knocking some doors and talking to people. Maybe we can uh, do something big for God now. Because you know what? We ought to take this as a wake-up call. Yeah, they almost shut down everything for eternity on us, right? But now things are opening back up. Let's take advantage of it as Christians. Our wisdom should be, we saw the warning. Now let's do something. And we sang the song, Onward, Christian Soldier. Whether you like it or not, you're a soldier for Christ. You may not want to, wanted to enlist, but you're in. What kind of soldier will you be? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, on Memorial Day, many have given their life for our nation. Lord, many, many have given their life for this book. Many have given their life for the gospel. Lord, and I believe many, many more will. Lord, as a Christian, the wisdom we should learn is every day is a memorial day when it comes to Christianity. We've taken it for granted too far, too far, too long in America. We've sat back in our castles, and it's a castle to most people around the world. I don't care how small your house is. Lord, Lord, we've sat back and done nothing. Lord, help every one of us in this room tonight to move, to just move, Lord, and do something. It can start with passing out a track. It can start with a phone call to the family member they love. It can start with a, I'm a sorry. It can start with anything. Lord, I just ask that you move through our church. Lord, if this is the getting close to the end, if Things are only going to get worse and they're not going to get better till you return. Then, Lord, let us put out a fight. Give us the Holy Spirit that it strengthens us. Let us fight one last fight. 
so we can give you all the honor and glory so that people can be saved and go to heaven. Lord, my heart's desire is that all America would be saved. But I know it won't. And with that kind of wisdom comes much sorrow. Oh, Lord, I wish all my family could be saved and serve in the Lord. But they all won't. And I can say with Solomon, with much wisdom is much sorrow. But Lord, help me to save what ones I can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.